Good evening. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Board of Education. Our meeting started this evening at approximately 6.05 um, in closed session um, for the purpose of discussion of three topics, approval of February 22nd, March 22nd, and April, 20, uh, April 12th, uh, 2011, respectively, closed session minutes, uh, discussion on employment of employee and collective negotiations. Mrs. Walsh, can you please call the roll? Mr. Calquist? Present. Mr. Collins? Here. Ms. Conroy? Here. Mrs. Davey? Present. Mrs. Droney? Here. Ms. Hirsch? Here. Mrs. Ostachek? Here. Uh, seven board members present, none are absent. Please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, thank you. Our next item on our agenda is outgoing board member recognition. <laughs> I'm going to pass, uh, I guess, the microphone to Dr. Krizik. Um, this evening, is, as we all know, we have four board members who um, are ending their terms. And um, in order to celebrate um, their accomplishments and their contributions and the time and energy that they have given this community, this staff, this district, and each of us individually sitting here um, at the table. Um, Mrs. Deroni is going to be doing the honors of doing the recognition. So I'm gonna turn this portion of the meeting over to Mrs. Deroni. Wherever you would like to be. Okay. Well, any board member will tell you that the best part of serving on the board is being able to recognize the accomplishments of our students and staff. So tonight, I have the pleasure, in fact, I have the honor of recognizing four of our own for their extraordinary accomplishments. And first, a big thank you to Malia Smith for sending a survey to the retiring board members to help me with this task. I enjoyed reading their musings of life in District 205, and I'm going to try very hard to be true to the spirit of what they had to say. Second, I need a couple of you to stand near the door. I'm so afraid that when our soon-to-be seated board members hear about all of the difficulties faced and the sacrifices made and the time commitment involved by these four who are leaving, that they're going to try to run out. So please just... I'm glad you're all there together and on that side of the room. I'll begin with Deborah Conroy. Deb has served on the board for four years. She was asked by friends and parents to run for the board because of her experience with navigating special education issues. She served as our representative to SASED, our special education cooperative, and on the intergovernmental committee. She also served as our vice president for two years. Deb feels the most difficult work we did during her tenure on the board was to find a way to deal with the unprecedented budget challenges that the state and the economy have created for us and for education. She enjoys the fact that we were able to maintain our excellent bond rating, yet keep the cuts as far away from the classroom as possible. Deb considers her most important accomplishment the facility that houses our transition students, giving them life skills for the next part of their journey. When asked what she learned while serving on the board, Deb replies, the responsibility to put the best interest of all students first in the decision-making process. We will miss your passion for serving children with special needs. We wish you well in whatever cause you pursue. Your wonderful artwork around town will serve as a reminder to all of us your deep commitment to the care and education of our children. Thank you, Deb. <laughs> Peggy Ostajik has served on the board for five years as board president for two. 
Peggy was first drawn to the board as a highly engaged parent. We're really fortunate to have a lot of these. She volunteered for various committees and then just seemed to be showing up at every meeting. In 2006, after a resignation of a board member, she applied for an open position and we appointed her from a field of extremely qualified candidates. The following year, she ran for election and the voters selected her as well. Peggy is most proud of the fact that the board is governed by a strategic plan that guides our difficult decisions, as she calls it, a high-level roadmap. She always does her homework, and we as a district and community have benefited from her willingness to do that, her willingness to listen to all voices, both on the board and in the community. We've also benefited from the fact that Peggy is a numbers person. In addition to her skill with finances and the balance sheet, we know she paid attention to the numbers on the clock. Peggy works in a northern suburb, and she would literally fly into our closed session, she did it tonight, coatless, breathless, in an attempt to start on time. We don't know if she ever got any speeding tickets over the last five years, but wouldn't that be an in-kind contribution? <laughs> Peggy served on the policy committee as our land representative and on an ad hoc committee for the selection of an architect and construction manager for the 0607 building projects. Peggy feels her most important accomplishment was helping to shape the direction of the board by doing the research, by being open and willing to listen to other board members and respectful of all opinions. Peggy, we will miss the structured focus you bring to every issue, your thoughtful consideration of all viewpoints, and your deep commitment to the children of Elmhurst. Marta Davey. Marta started attending board meetings when her children were small. She was at first following special education issues. But like all committed board members, she quickly became involved and interested in all aspects of the district. She put her finance degree from U of I to good use here and brought with her a rich heritage of dedication to public education. Both her parents were public school teachers, and two of her children now teach in the Chicago public school system. Marta joined the board at a really awkward time. Due to a change in the law, she was elected in November of 1998, but couldn't be seated until April of the following year. Imagine, new board members, with all your enthusiasm and eagerness and great ideas and willingness to get started, having to bottle all that up for five months. While we invited her to sit at the board table and take part in discussion, she could not vote. Kind of puts your three-week delay in a little different perspective. Over the years, regardless of the time commitment, Marta was always ready to step up to the plate and volunteer for the job. When asked to do something, she never said she didn't have the time. She made the time. And I'm not just talking about the school board either. Marta has held leadership roles in numerous organizations, to name a few, Rotary, AAUW, and her church. But Marta rarely missed one of our meetings. And I always got the feeling that in her heart of hearts, the school district came first. So Marta, when you leave here tonight, you <clears throat> may want to call your pastor and work that out with him. <laughs> During her 12-year tenure on the board, Marta served as vice president for two years, secretary for two years, and board president for two years. About eight years ago, she devoted countless hours to a statewide governor's commission to rewrite the entire school code. She's been active with our legislators in Springfield to lobby for the specific needs of our district. She served on the policy committee as a land representative on intergovernmental committees, the TIF annual joint review committee, the board of education liaison with a referendum committee. I can't even list them all. 
In addition, she served on two negotiating committees with the teachers union. In the session five years ago, during the end of one set of really tense negotiations, Marta cut her vacation short to come back and present a final proposal to the teachers union. We all maintained it was her departure from her usual business suit to colorful capris and a golf shirt that changed the mood and cinched the deal. <laughs> Marta is most proud of the board accomplishments over the last four years. The depth and breadth in the increase of student achievement we have seen and the addition of critical structures and systems to help support our strategic vision. One of her strengths is her ability to apply, a to apply a larger lens to the state of education and its funding to understand and think through the bigger state picture and the effects that it has on issues at our own table. When asked what she learned on the, while serving on the board, Marta states that she has learned to appreciate the value of the diversity within our schools. She's learned that this diversity strengthens us and challenges us always to consider the needs of each student. Marta, we will miss your perspective, your uncompromising fairness, your insatiable desire to learn it all, and we will really miss the fact that you never say no when asked to do yet another thing. That's Marta. Dave Carlquist was also appointed to the board after a resignation in 1990. He was a newlywed. He had no children yet. I guess he got hooked because he went on to run for election and got elected five times. His oldest is now a freshman at Northwestern University and he has two other children at York. Jean is Dave's wife and when her friends bemoan the fact that they feel like a hockey widow or a golf widow or a football widow, she just stares them down with, don't even get me started. <laughs> Dave has served the district for 21 years. Should that entitle you to a pension? <laughs> All right, we spent those funds on technology upgrades or lower class sizes or new gym lockers or something. For the record, for the press, that was a joke. Board members do not receive compensation, much less pensions. <laughs> On a more serious note, in the early years of his service, it was Dave's wisdom and compassion that helped the board struggle through the sudden death of Superintendent Russell Themes, and later, the lingering illness and death of board president Pat Collins. While the official record indicates Dave was president for only two years, he was vice president during Pat's illness, adding about three more years that he bore the time commitment and increased responsibility of board president. Dave is most proud of his stewardship to the community. He has always pushed for high quality, broad opportunities for students to learn and excel, and quality facilities in which they can do that all the while maintaining strong financial health to support the whole system. He modestly lists his most important accomplishment as tenacity. I prefer to call it dedication. He has worked with four superintendents, 11 different boards, 21 different board members, and learned from all of them. When asked exactly what he has learned, he actually models the very values of lifelong learning that we hold for every member of District 205. What he has learned is, quote, there is always something more to learn, no matter how long one serves as a board member. Every board struggles with how best to communicate our message. Dave is an advocate for getting the right message out and getting it out often. In his own words, Quote, there is no such thing as over-communicating. Yes, Dave, <laughs> we know. 
you may not know this, but some of our shortest meetings were the ones that you had to miss. Not a criticism, I'm just saying. Over the last 21 years, what has gotten Dave through the rough times, and there have been a few, is the inspiration provided each fall when kindergartners line up eagerly for their first day of school, and again in the spring, when he and the rest of us hand York graduates their diplomas. Dave, we will miss your razor-sharp ability to cut through to the core of an issue and your whole picture approach to the analysis of every problem. We will miss your steady focus on improving technology for both instruction and operations. Dave never lets us forget that he's a techie at heart. He will say things like, that new hire really has the bandwidth we need right now. Or, let's double click on that issue for a moment. Or, could we copy and paste this approach at the elementary school and take it throughout the district? We will miss the mentoring that you have provided to new board members throughout the years and your special insights into balancing the needs of students with those of taxpayers. We will miss your dedication. Now, <clears throat> I know this is too long and Peggy is getting close to buzzing me off the podium here, <clears throat> but these fine board members spent a collective 42 years serving our children. So I'm going to take just a few more minutes to convey in their own words the advice that our retiring members have for our soon to be seated new members. And they're still here, that's good. From Deb Conroy to new board members, quote, I would say listen to each other. Do not get caught up in a power struggle. Think of your job as being an advocate for all students. Always put students' needs first. From Peggy Ostajik, she says, the commitment to public service is honorable and I thank them for their willingness to invest their time and energy on behalf of District 205. They should remember that they are one voice of seven and they should bring their voice to every discussion. But at the end of the board vote, they need to support the voice of the board even if the board vote is different from their individual opinions. We are fortunate to have an engaged community that places a high value on education, and they come forth with passionate statements. I always learned something from the input I received, even if I didn't completely agree with it. Finally, I would remind them to maintain an environment of respect. From Marta Davy, in her words, getting elected to the Board of Education is a popularity contest. From the point you are sworn in, the popularity contest ends. You will need to make decisions that are sometimes unpopular, even with those who have helped you get elected. The focus must be on what's best for the entire district. She goes on, it took me several years to understand just how complex a school district is. Every decision you make will need to be made in the context of the whole, and not what will benefit any one specific part of the whole. Finding this balance is very challenging, and I extend my best wishes to all of the newly elected board members. And last, from David Carlquist. Are we surprised that it's the longest? <laughs> Listen carefully to the often very quiet voice of the majority. Ground all decisions on what's best for students and taxpayers. Work effectively as a member of a team that makes good decisions and provides quality leadership. Be sufficiently sensitive to be tuned into the diversity of opinion across a community but suitably unruffled to cope with the inevitable criticism that will arise. Focus on policy and process. 
Let administrators and teachers do the job that they have been specially trained and hired to do. You can ensure there is accountability in the system without micromanaging. Set the right tone by choosing to spend time on what matters most. For example, does the board spend the right amount of time discussing, discussing governance, curriculum, and instruction in high impact topics? Or is meeting time consumed with more urgent, less important items? And finally, he says, make time for the enjoyable parts of the job, such as attending school events, retirement tees, PTA council meetings, and other situations that connect you with students, staff, and the community. To all of our retiring members, Deb, Peggy, Marta, Dave, we thank you for your dedication to our children, and we are deeply appreciative of the difference you have made in our community. I prepared a laundry list of all the accomplishments that have taken place on your watch, but decided that in your selflessness, you would just attribute these things to teachers or staff or the administration or the community at large. And besides, that list is way too long. Instead, please know that we stand on your shoulders and can only hope to build upon the groundwork that you and the countless others you have worked with laid. You know, teachers sometimes get the pleasure of knowing when they have made a difference, and those have to be very rewarding moments. But board members, not so much. No one contacts a school board member years later and says, thank you, you've touched my life. But believe me, your years of service to District 205 have made a difference. Countless times. And as we say in our recognition of students and staff, you bring pride and prestige to District 205 and to the community of Elmhurst. And as we also say, the Board of Education and Administration of District 205 express deep appreciation for your accomplishments. And if you find you have nothing to do on Tuesday nights, the lights are on, you know where to find us. How about a standing ovation for the appreciation of these fine public servants? I'm going to announce that the red light has gone off and we're taking the microphone away from Mrs. Deroni now. <laughs> so thank you very much. We appreciate your kind words. I'm going to... Uh, we, we have plaques, too. Oh, there are okay. plaques. I'm not going to say anything else. We just have plaques. Come on up. Could we have the four retiring board members come in front, you know, just like the cross-country team does? You know, we'll take your picture. Susan, you're going to take two of them. Okay, let's do it. Come on. Mrs. Osajek, true to form to Mrs. Deroni's characterization, I'm going to ask for the microphone one last time. <laughs> 
Uh, very briefly, I wanted to be able to say uh, four points. One is congratulations to the new board members who uh, are being seated this evening. You've been entrusted with an awesome responsibility, and it's a wonderful experience. Secondly, I wanted to say thank you publicly on the record to the community of Elmers for the opportunity to have served in this role. Um, it. Um, uh, have learned a lot, and it's been, a, 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 again, very, very rewarding. Thirdly, I wanted to say a special thank you to the staff members, uh, administration, teachers, cabinet members, support personnel across the district, both present and, and past. Um, as a board member, I think each of us helps and hopes that we can bring some degree of value to the district in support of the professionals who really make things happen and get the job done day in and day out. So very appreciative of that. Thank you, Mrs. Deroni, for the words this evening. Uh, and then last but not least, I want to just publicly be able to say thank you to uh, four women who are very important in my life, and that's my daughters, Kelly, Sarah, and Carrie, and my wife, Jean, who have selflessly shared my nearly 10,000 hours uh, over this period of time with uh, District 205. And so to them, I wanted to publicly say thank you. Um, again, thank you for Okay, we are going to continue on. Um, th this is a little bit of an unusual meeting because we uh, do a transition between uh, the current Board of Education and the new Board of Education. Um, so there's some actions and items that come under the sitting board and then we'll do a transition to the new board. Um, but under our uh, current board business, our next item is um, public comment. So um, consistent with our standard policy, I will call your name and if you can come up uh, to the microphone and start with your name and address and please limit your comments to three minutes. There's a little timer light up there that'll help you keep track of it. Um, so I will start with the spur first speaker and I apologize if I mispronounce the last name, Julie Villarreal. My name is Julie Villarreal. My address is 656 West Comstock Avenue here in Elmhurst. I have two children attending schools in District 205. The purpose of my attending this meeting tonight is to urge the board to reconsider cutting the industrial technology department at York High School. As you know, the vast majority of our property taxes go to support the schools. When we moved to Elmhurst 15 years ago, our taxes were $1,700 per year. This year, they are $6,800. I have voted in favor of all four referendums to improve our schools because I believe in the importance of a good education for my children, even when a second job was needed to make that happen. All children learn differently, and a good school district will offer a variety of opportunities for each of them. Although by any standard, my son Ben would be considered on the college prep track at York, he has made use of the classes in the industrial technology department. Because of his interest in becoming an engineer, computer-aided drafting or CAD classes have been essential to his preparation. These classes have given him an opportunity to learn hands-on skills that he will need in his future profession, which are different from the theories taught to him in the math and science departments. Ben has taken every engineering-related course offered by the Industrial Technology Department. In this, his last semester at York, he was able to create an independent study thanks to his dedicated teacher, Elizabeth Wall. This Saturday, he will be competing in the state competition for CAD. Next week, I will be attending two breakfast ceremonies at York, one honoring him as the student of the month for the Industrial Technology Department, and the other inducting him into the National, Honor, National Technical Honor Society. Ben would not have had these opportunities if the industrial technology department had been cut. My younger son, Nicholas, is at Emerson and dreams of becoming an architect. A strong industrial technology department will be needed to help him fulfill that dream. I hope that the same opportunities will be made available to Nicholas when he too arrives at York. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lee Ann Alamarone. My name is Leanne Alamrong. I reside at 225 North Willow Road here in Elmhurst. 
I am the mother of three boys currently attending York High School. On September 9th, 2008, my oldest son, Mitch, attained a traumatic brain injury on the football practice field at York High School during a hitting drill. He can never play again. This was devastating for Mitch as he played football since he was six years old. Mitch had to focus on a different passion of his, and he did, automotive technology. Mitch is currently the auto club president. He will be attending COD in the fall to get certifications in the auto field. I would like to read you a statement made by my son. My experience in York's industrial technology program has shaped who I am. After having a traumatic brain injury, the automotive program has given me a dream. It has been why I have fought so hard to recover. I can take what I have learned and use it for my future. In return, I have taken what I have learned and used it to teach other students. When other students need assistance, I can use my knowledge to help them. I've also represented York High School in state competitions. I've been to Skills USA twice for the collision repair competition. Representing York, I placed sixth place both times. Being a state competitor is something that I will always be proud of, and I can take these skills and use them the rest of my life. That was the end of Mitch's statement. My father learned printing at Proviso West High School in the industrial tech department. From there, he went on to do tool and die. My grandfather and my great-grandfather were both electricians. Working hands keep these, this nation moving forward. Our children are the future. I know my son Mitch would not have had much of a future if his hands were not well trained. His brain injury will be with him the rest of his life, but so will the skills that he learned here in the automotive technology department. Wouldn't it be a good idea to keep the industrial tech department so we can train the working class of tomorrow? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Margaret Harrell. Good afternoon. My name is Margaret Harrell, and I live at 17 West 261 Rodeck. I wanted to discuss the fee for the bus. I'm going to say both the before school and after school. And just to give an example of what this fee is, for any student in middle school who uses the bus to go to choir, band, orchestra, they will pay this additional fee of $330 a year. It was before it was zero. For any high school student who uses the bus for late, which would include clubs, serving any detentions, making up any tests or other after school activities, as well as athletics, they will also pay this $330 um, dollar fee a year. I understand that our district is facing incredible financial issues. I participated in the EPIRT process and we went through and selected the, and ranked the areas that we thought were most, um, could be most affected by this, this in decrease. Transportation was certainly one of them. We made that de uh, cut to, uh, to transportation and the late fee for athletics or clubs was not in that initial group. We also went back and I looked at the notes and I saw that there was a decision that an additional $57,750, which was the fee for the late fee, was added to the transportation costs. I think it was approximately $235,000 for a total reduction of $292,000. Now for a fee of $330, I assume the estimate would be approximately 175 children would be affected by this. I have two questions for the board um, to try to help me to understand this increase and to ask you to review the impact that this is going to have on our community. My first question is I wonder how you estimate the number of children who ride this activity bus. Obviously an average would not account for children who ride it once um, for a detention or perhaps three or four times a year for a club that are being now asked to pay $330. My second question is, did you anticipate how this fee 
would affect participation levels and ultimately decrease projected revenue. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker is Jane Bailey. We won't have to worry about the yellow light. I'm Jean Bailey, Principal Conrad Fisher, and I just wanted to extend our um, appreciation from Conrad Fisher School community to Ms. Davey, Mr. Carlquist, Ms. Conroy O'Keefe, and Ms. Ostachek for your years of service. It is a thankless job, sometimes under intense public scrutiny, often without recognition for a job well done, um, without perks or great benefits, but please know, on behalf of the kids at Fisher, you have made a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and just for, for those that are unfamiliar with our public comment policy, um, it's the board's practice not to respond to um, specific items of public comment. Um, we did hear what you said. We appreciate uh, you, you bringing information to the board. If, things relate to items on the agenda. They might be covered later on, but I don't believe that any of these specific topics are covered. So again, thank you for um, bringing your thoughts, your ideas, your concerns to the board. Um, we are going to move on. Um, we have the approval of board meeting minutes from March 22nd and April 12th. Um, are there any corrections or amendments to these minutes as presented? Seeing none, they will be pr approved as they are presented. Um, we now move on to the reorganization of the Board of Education. Um, I have an acknowledged receipt of the certified election results uh, confirming the election of John McDonough, Karen Stufen, Chris Bloom, and Shannon Hennessy Ebner to the Board of Education. Um, so that is the first piece uh, that we need in order to seat the new board members. Um, I will now read the oath of office to the newly elected board members. So if you could please stand and raise your right hand and repeat after me. Um, I, I, and state your name. Do solemnly swear that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of member of the Board of Education of Elmhurst Community School District 205. In accordance with the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Illinois. And the laws of the State of Illinois. To the best of my ability. I further swear or affirm that I shall respect taxpayers' interest by, faithful, uh, by serving as a faithful protector of the school district's assets. Do you have a copy? Okay. I shall encourage and respect the free expression of my opinion, of opinion by my fellow board members. And others who seek a hearing before the board while respecting the privacy of students and employees. I shall recognize that a board member has no legal authority as an individual. And that decisions can be made only by a majority vote at a public board meeting. And the decisions can be made only by a majority vote at a public board meeting. And I shall abide by majority decisions of the board. And I shall abide by majority decisions of the board. While retaining the right to seek changes in such decisions through ethical and constructive channels. While retaining the right to seek changes in such decisions through ethical and constructive channels. Okay. Congratulations to our new board members. Um, we will now uh, have a motion to adjourn our current board, Sine Dai, and what that will do is essentially permanently adjourn uh, the, the current board of education. The new board members 
will be seated and they will start with election of your officer. So may I have a motion, please? I move the Board of Education adjourn uh, sine die. Okay. A move by Mr. Carlquist, seconded by Mrs. Conroy. All in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Uh, this Board of Education is adjourned. Um, I will now entertain a motion to for a nomination of the President Pro Tem. Do I have a motion? I nominate Maria Hirsch for President Pro Tem. Are there any other nominations? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All in favor, motion passes. Ray Hirsch is president pro tem. Thank you, Dr. Krizik. Um, uh, one other housekeeping order, we need to um, nominate a secretary pro tem. The, this, this president pro tem and the secretary pro tem are governing just this transition period. So it's a very short tenure. Um, so can I have a nomination, please, for the secretary pro tem? I nominate Jim Collins. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, I will uh, announce Jim Collins as the secretary pro tem by acclamation. Sorry, thank you. Um, I will now call to order this new uh, Board of Education. This is our first meeting. Uh, Mrs. Walsh, can you please call the roll? Mr. Bloom? Here. Mr. Collins? Here. Mrs. Droney? Here. Mrs. Ebner? Here. Ms. Hirsch? Here. Mr. McDonough? Here. Mrs. Stufen? Here. Thank you, Mrs. Walsh. Are seven board members present? Uh, we have a quorum. Um, the first order of business for the, this transitional meeting, there's only one order of business, and that is uh, a nomination of a president for the Board of Education to move forward. Can I please have a nomination for the president of the board? I nominate Susan Deroney. Are there any other nominations? Thank you. Instead of uh, by acclamation, can I have a show of hands, please, for those of us that are willing to support Susan Deroney as the Board of Education moving forward? I think I can count to seven. Congratulations, Mrs. Deroney. You will be moving forward as our new uh, president for the newly seated Board of Education. And at this point, it's time for me to turn the meeting over to you. Thank you. The first order of business is to Accept nominations for the Office of Vice President. Is there a nomination? I would nominate Maria Hirsch. Maria Hirsch has been nominated for the Office of Vice President. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, the nominations are closed. I would ask for a show of hands for all those in favor of Maria Hirsch as Vice President, please. Looks like 7-0. Congratulations, Mrs. Hirsch. Next order of business is to open nominations for the Office of Secretary. Are there any nominations for the uh, position of Secretary? I would like to nominate Mr. Collins. Jim Collins has been nominated for Secretary of the Board of Education. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, nominations are closed. Could I please see a show of hands, all those in favor of Mr. Collins being Secretary of the Board of Education? Congratulations, we have our new board officers. Um, you want us to play musical chairs now, Dr. Krizik? <laughs> okay, we will do that.
Ellie, David, could you have Ellie come up and maybe help everyone get a little um, connected? While everybody's computer is booting up here, I just want to say that I have rarely been so excited to work with a new board as I am tonight. Um, I've listened carefully to what you've had to say to us over the last um, few weeks. I have to say that these people here at this board have done their part in raising the level of the economy in the coffee shops in Elmhurst as we have been all meeting with one another one-on-one -on -one in attempt to get to know each other so that we can proceed with our feet on the ground running. Um, I think we have a great group. We have seven people bringing seven different skill sets and I'm really, really convinced that we're going to be a great team and I'm going to do all I can to see that that happens. So. Um, next order of business is reaffirmation, no, establishment of the regular meeting schedule. You have in your packets uh, a meeting schedule for, that will govern your life for the next year. Um, could I have a motion to establish the regular meeting schedule for the next um, board year? So moved. Moved by uh, Mr. McDonough, second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Hirsch to, to establish the regular meeting schedule. Is there any discussion about that schedule? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. That motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the uh, reaffirmation of all existing contracts and policies. This is something that the board does just so that everybody knows that we're going to continue on doing the things we've done, our policy manual is in place, and so forth. Is there a motion to reaffirm all existing contracts and policies? So moved. Moved by Mrs. Hirsch. Is there a second? Seconded by Mrs. Stufen. Moved and seconded to reaffirm all existing contracts and policies. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. That motion carries. Next item on the agenda is board committee appointments. And I would like to suggest that we postpone that until our meeting on May 10th. It would give us some time to have a little bit more conversation about what your, all of your interests are, what um, you would like to do on um, special committees, on some of the other uh, groups that we are a part of. So if you would please, I would ask for a motion to postpone until May 10th the board committee appointments. I move we postpone board committee appointments until May 10th. Is there a second? Second. Been moved by Mr. Collins, seconded by Mrs. Hirsch to um, postpone until May 10th all board committee appointments. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. That motion carries. Uh, what do we got next? Superintendent communication. Dr. Krizik. Uh, the first item is um, just kind of review of the status of the 2010 tax levy. And generally I make an introduction, but I have had a history lately of stealing Ms. Masterton's thunder by doing her presentation. So I'm just going to turn the meeting over to Ms. Masterton to give you an update um, in terms of what happened with the um, tax extension. Ms. Masterton. Thank you, Dr. Krizik. Um, over the past year, we have uh, reviewed the timeline and process for um, our tax levy and extension, and we are now at the point of the tax extension part of it. The, what's the difference between the tax levy and the tax extension? In the fall, we pass a levy for property taxes that's more than what we expect to receive. The levy is the amount of property taxes that we ask for. 
and we ask for more because we want to make sure that we are able to maximize our um, monies under the tax cap. On March 22, 2011, we received a breakdown of the amount of property taxes that will be extended on our behalf. In other words, billed out to our taxpayers. The extension is the amount of taxes that we expect to receive. And we generally have a distribution that's close to 99%. Um, coming back to us, so that's a that's very good in in our area. Our first distribution, the 2010 property tax extension, will be received on or around June 1st of 2011. So we're really always working kind of a year behind in terms of what we're receiving in there. Let's go over a little bit our equalized assessed valuation changes that have gone in on, and of course our taxes are are based on our equalized assessed valuation. Um, in 2009, our EAV was about $2.65 uh, billion, and in 2010, we've had a drop to $2,451,025.82. Um, that's actually wrong on this there. We've had an actual change of 7.6% drop in EAV, and I can look at that figure and say something's wrong on there. So that is probably closer to $200 million in, in a drop in EAV, the change um, drop. Um, our new growth in 2009 was 23835592 which was low in comparison to what we've had in prior years. Um, I think in 2007 we were closer to $80 million. In 2008 we were probably around 45 to $50 million. Um, so now in 2009 we were down to 23, almost 24 million. This year 19 million, 219, 536. And of course, um, outside of the CPI amount, the only additional monies that we can receive is from our new growth. So when our new growth is low, that means that we're not going to be getting that much additional income. That change is a drop of $4.6 million between 2009 and 2010, or a 19.36 decrease in new growth. I really never expected to be talking about decreases in EAV, and particularly in this community, but this has been quite an interesting couple of years for economists and economy. In 2009 and 2010, the equalized assessed valuation changes. Um, the 2009 EAV dropped um, 6,583,329, and in 2010, actually, you know, quite a bit more than that, as we saw. Um, and so our total loss is probably closer to $206 million of EAV. Our new growth dropped a total of twenty million eight ninety five seven twenty four over a two year period. Okay. Let's break out our EAV property by um, by property type and residential, which is a major part in York Township in particular, but really in all of in both of our townships. Um, residential accounts for um, one point five eight six billion dollars in EAV. Commercial one hundred sixty seven million. Industrial a very small six hundred fifty three thousand. And railroad um, accounts for, as we know, there's trains everywhere in Elmhurst, so that's $1.1 million of EAV. So our total York Township um, breakout is one, almost $1.8 million, billion. Um, in Addison Township, our residential accounts for $462 million. Farms, uh, a scant $554 um, in EAV. Commercial, $77 million, And industrial, and that's that northern area um, close to Bensonville um, and parts of Elmhurst, is $154 million, For a total in Addison Township of a little over $694 million in EAV. We also have just a small amount of Cook County residential in the Yorkfield area. That's 671,106 of residential EAV. And the breakdown of our new growth is 79.97% in residential, 12.49 in commercial, no industrial, and our prior year exempt, which means that there was exempt property that is now no longer exempt by probably by a sale of 7.54%. Our extension estimates in November of 2010, when we when we did our levy, I also presented at that time um, our our levy, 
our expected amount that we'll be receiving and our prior years. And so our expected amount was a grand total of 94,844,65. We expected the rate to be about 3.68 and a 4.17% increase. Our regular extension increase we expected to be 3.61 um, and 2,895,871 uh, in, in, as an increase. Our bond and interest we expected to increase 781,656 for a total extension increase of 3 million, almost $700,000. That would have been a 198% increase from 2009 to 2010. And that, of course, is because our extension um, increase from the prior year was at a 0.1 CPI. And so it was very, very small in comparison to this year. <laughs> our actual final extension received on 322 was a 3.77% increase, 91,486,794. And our rate will be 3.7326 per $100 of equalized assessed valuation. Our regular extension increase will be, um, for, the, for regular funds, will be 3.54% and will amount to $2,836,520. Our bond and interest extension increase is 487337 so a total extension increase of $3,323,857. Um, that's an extension increase from the prior year, 2009, of 169.3%. So slightly less, and of course, that's because our new property growth is down in there, a little more than we expected. Here's our actual levy or extension um, information of how much we'll be receiving in each of the funds. In the education fund, we expect that it will increase 3.5% um, to $69,020,739 um, uh, in some sense. Operations and maintenance at $9,068,776. Transportation at a little over $1.4 million. IMRF, which is the Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund, which is the retirement fund of our classified staff, um, is $1.5 million. Social Security is also for our classified staff, not for our teachers who do not pay into Social Security, but it does encompass Medicare, and our teachers do pay into Medicare, as do we as a matching amount. And that would be a little over $1 million. And we always try to put a little extra money into our working cash. Our working cash is a little bit of a... Uh, savings account, if you want, it's it's putting away that money for when we're you know really really needing it, and it helps with our cash flow um, because of course in May it's our lowest of time of money, how much money that we have, um, and so we'll reach a, a bottoming out point right before we get our first uh, extension amount, and that's twenty two thousand fifty nine dollars for working cash. We also are um, levy for special education um, dollars, and we will receive $906,878. So a total of $82,967,046.70 for our regular funds and bonded interest, another $8.5 million for a grand total of that $91,486,794.24, um, or a 3.77% increase from the prior year. And I will be happy to take any questions. Any questions, Mr. Collins? Ms. Masterton, you, when we discussed the budget uh, a couple months ago, mm -hmm. you had projected revenues exceeding projected expenses of $149. From I take it this wipes that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, it does. So, um, we're going to probably, you know, still be fine in terms of, of dollars. And um, and next year, because of the EPER um, changes and hopefully with some um, some positive changes in other areas, we, we should be able to build our fund balances to be at a safer level than it has been. Um, we're very fortunate that uh, we are not going to have to do tax anticipation warrants. 
Um, that was a goal of mine. I've never had to do it in my career, and I didn't want to start now. And um, so it doesn't appear that we're going to have to do tax anticipation warrants. And that's particularly good when you consider the fact that the state is still in arrears to us by a large amount. So um, we're, we're pretty happy that we're, we're moving forward. And that really has to do with the board um, and the administration and the teachers and everyone else who's taken um, a hard look at our finances and made the effort to find reductions where we need to make reductions. Mrs. Hirsch. Thank you, Mrs. Masterton. Could you just give us um, the, the numbers that we're talking about, the, the 91 million, which includes the bond and interest payments, that represents the local property tax base. Those are the revenues that come to the district for all of the taxpayers that live within our boundaries who are writing their real estate tax checks um, in uh, you know twice a year, and those revenues come to us. Can you just, for the benefit of the relatively new board that we have, this is the majority of the revenues that we receive, but we also receive revenues from the state as well as revenues from the federal government. There are some things that are changing there. If you could just give a very high level. I know we'll be talking about revenues in the budget in the summer, but just to put things in perspective, if you could give us a quick update. Well, I, I could have said um, in the past that uh, the property tax and other local funds, which include school fees, um, rental fees, um, uh, donations, we occasionally, we used to, when there was actually building going on in, in, in Elmhurst and Bensonville, we got some impact fee money um, from um, the city of Elmhurst, um, as well as from Bensonville. Um, um, if there's a distribution of TIF dollars, which we don't expect this year, uh, again, everything seems to be drying up, but um, those are also all considered to be local dollars, or and some of it is money in lieu of taxes, and some of it is just plain local fees, um, lunch lunch money, that's all local fees. So local um, dollars, in, which is the majority of obviously is property taxes, um, amounts to about under normal circumstances the last few years about 90% of our income. The state would normally be about 7%. And the state funds consist of, number one, the largest amount is um, for most districts general state aid. Um, it's larger for districts who are less wealthy, um, and wealth is considered to be the amount of EAV per student that you have. Obviously, with uh, somewhere in the range of $2.5 billion of EAV, we are fairly wealthy in terms of um, EAV per student. Uh, and so um, uh, we generally receive about... Uh, about $340, $350, Jan would know exactly because I sent it to her, um, per student in, in, in uh, general state aid. It's about $3.3 million that we receive. Other districts may receive much more than that. And downstate, for instance, they receive a large amount of their income um, not from property taxes, because they're mainly farms, and there is you know, a different type of taxing for farms, um, but through general state aid. So general state aid is generally the most solid of um, revenue source from the state. We will get general state aid. If we don't get general state aid, that means that the state is in terrible, terrible shape. It doesn't mean that we'll necessarily see increases in general state aid, but we will at least see that. The second part of, of state aid is in categorical programs. And categorical programs consist of special education personnel through the state, bilingual, um, uh, lunch uh, for free and reduced lunch programs. Um, it used to be textbook um, money. We don't get that anymore. That's dried up. Um, there used to be reading support money. That's dried up. So bit by bit, um, uh, many of the grants, categorical grants, have either been put into a block grant or just disappeared. And so um, the state is slowly dwindling down to about mm, 5 to 6 percent, and only because of general state aid continuing to be there. So the state is generally, you could figure, about 6 to $7 million if we get it. You have to understand that outside of general state aid, payments made from the state are few and far between. And although they may say that they have, they're going to be giving us this money, we frequently just don't get it. 
they're in arrears for a very long period of time to um, school districts and to vendors. And um, at this point, I think they owe us about $2.6 million. So, um, and that goes up because we've only received one categorical payment this year. We got all of last year's, which is, you know, kind of a surprise, but we've only received one so far this year. Uh, the federal is normally about 3 to 4 percent, uh, and it was a little bit more in the last year or two because of the jobs, uh, education, funding um, that we received as well as um, through our ARRA funds, American Recovery and Rehabilitation Act, In, yeah, whatever, Reinvestment and, and Act, um, the Obama dollars, as they like to call it. We're at the end of those, so that's gone too. And the only other thing that we really, really get any kind of money for is for special education through IDEA. And that's a little over a million dollars, a million and a half dollars. We, we were getting title money, and we're still getting title money, Title I money, but that's also kind of dropped back. And Title II will be gone next year, we think. So outside of our property taxes, we really don't have any stable sort of income from year to year. Property taxes is our most stable source of income. Any other questions for Ms. Masterton? Seeing none, thank you. Um, let's move on to the middle school social studies adoption. I'm gonna turn this over to um, Dr. Sullivan who will um, introduce uh, Therese Ulrich and just kind of give you an update about where we are in the process this evening and the presentation you'll be hearing. Um, back in January, we presented a social studies study. It's the first time that the social studies curriculum, K-12, to had been looked at in 11 years. So it's been sorely needed. And one of the particular areas that was our priority that we identified for the board then was uh, particularly middle school um, for several reasons, most of which being that we can no longer get teacher additions and we're having a very difficult time even getting um, used student additions at this point because it, the, the material is being so old. So that is where we targeted our first um, look. So I'm going to ask Teresa Ulrich to come up and she has some of our um, very distinguished and uh, talented social studies department chairs here with her tonight and she's going to introduce those folks to you um, and talk to you about what we're going to ask in terms of um, looking at a, an adoption for the f upcoming school year. Good evening. Um, thank you for allowing me to be here this evening and welcome to our new board members. It's a privilege to present to you tonight. I couldn't have gotten as far as I've gotten with our middle school social studies progress without the help of some very important people who are here with me tonight and I'd like to introduce them to you. We have Carolyn Brandt from um, Sandbird Middle School, Tony White from Churchville Middle School, and Jim Tang from Bryan Middle School. And they are the department chairs for the social studies at their middle schools and worked collaboratively with me and their staff in this entire process. This evening, we're going to look at some timelines that we've been um, setting, a little bit of our history, where we are and where we need to go looking at some of the criteria that we use to do the evaluation of the text that we've been reviewing, how we came to the results of the selection that we've made, and then to make a recommendation to display the selected text for 30 days after this evening. My first year here in the district, 2009-2010, was spent trying to determine what the social studies curriculum was. As Dr. Sullivan indicated, the social studies area had not been supervised at the district level for more than 10 years, and so it did require some research. The results of that effort turned into a compilation of a study that was presented in January, and that presentation indicated a sore need for updated materials and curriculum. 
one of the areas that we needed to focus on immediately was the middle school level. As Dr. Sullivan said, we are no longer able to get texts and teachers additions for the middle school. So we had um, a significant challenge because we really wanted to have power standards in place before selecting a text. And so our power standards writing was really happening simultaneously as we were reviewing textbooks. For 2011 to 2013, we hope to be making progress in our curriculum implementation. Our process for selecting texts began with reviewing seven different publishers, and really that was about all there was to choose from because these days publishers have become a conglomerate one buying out others, and when we reviewed what was available, really there were only four that offered complete programs with a student text, teacher's edition, and appropriate supportive materials. From there, middle schools either piloted and or reviewed the selections from the four different publishers. During this process, as a collaborative team effort working as a professional learning community, I, the department chairs, and the, all the social studies teachers were involved in developing a rubric that would assess the value and help us make a final determination for our selection of publisher. As I mentioned, during the same time, practically, we were also working on power standards. And this was a process of looking at Illinois state standards, common core standards for literacy in the social studies in US history, looking at the national standards from the National Council of the Social Studies, and then pre-prioritizing those standards and creating a focus. Uh, th those standards kind of gave us some guidance in making selections as well as the rubrics. And when all of the texts were evaluated, the rubrics were calculated, comments were submitted, they played a significant role in the final determination of which text we wanted to recommend for display. In our rubric, we wanted to assure that we were selecting a text that supported instruction, considered student experience, gave opportunities to assess progress, fully met students' needs by differentiated instruction, incorporated technology, considered learning goals, promoted student inquiry and active engagement, but in addition, provided support to the teachers. And as I mentioned, this was a collaborative effort. The criteria, each question was rated on a five-point scale, and all of the teachers were involved in this process as well as the evaluation. The highest priority for selection was given to the rubric scoring. The, the selected text received the highest overall rating as well as the highest rating within each category. But other things that we considered when we were making our selection were the opportunities that were evident to address writing and critical thinking skills. Multiple opportunities embedded in instruction to provide differentiated instruction. Um, something that we valued highly, which goes along with our strategic plan and our initiatives, this particular selection emphasized literacy through content. Also, extensive technology opportunities are available for students, parents, and teachers with the selection. It has multiple diagnostic opportunities ranging from informal assessments through discussion, lesson plans, but in addition, it offers teachers um, more um, of a, a, a view of um, precise understanding of what students have learned through formal summative assessment, which assessments, which can look at students' performance through item analysis. One of the other benefits that we appreciated about this particular text was that it was current 
It's going to be a 2012 edition, and it's immediately available and complete, and that was not necessarily true for all of the works that we looked at. They weren't either as polished as the work that we are considering, or um, some parts were not quite ready and we weren't even able to review the entire program at the time that we were doing so. But one of the very strong impacts was the cost was unparalleled with all that this particular publisher had to offer. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm done. Great. That's okay. Um, I, I, when I'm, maybe I'm pressing the wrong thing. I'm sorry. Let me try it again. There we go. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, another thing that we considered was the student perspective. We didn't want to forget about the work that we had done in the study, and we reviewed those things that students said that they wanted from their social studies texts and social studies instruction. And they clearly expressed a desire for interactive instruction, and they have it either working with the teacher or with technology, and many opportunities to work in groups. There were a high number of students who had interest in reading social studies and history material. And as part of our package, we are being given leveled content readers and thematic, thematic novels that relate to the social studies content themes in our texts. A number of students indicated that they enjoyed viewing and watching programs related to history and the social studies. And this program has incredibly digital media, including video clips, embedded into the student digital texts. So at certain points in their reading, they can click on a link and have a visual clip to demonstrate what it is that they're reading about. Also, students indicated they wanted to be challenged but at the same time, they wanted to be able to access texts. And this book does promote inquiry and critical thinking, and it is an accessible a text for middle school level. Some additional advantages that we found, the text is age and grade appropriate in content and reading level. Also, it provides access to primary and secondary sources, which is critical for social studies instruction. It also provides access to more than 9,000 digital media clips, including numer numerous videos from the History Channel. Not only is a hi the History Channel a well-known, uh, respected resource, but an additional bonus, as the district has already made prior investments in products from the History Channel, so this will transition very nicely and we'll be able to continue to use supplements that are already in place. The contents in the book and its themes are appropriate for middle school, and our representative, the department chair at the high school, finds that the content in the textbook is sound for middle school. The total cost of the package of consideration is $176,000. $299.20, and I want to be clear that there is no extra cost that we're asking for materials. Everything we wanted and more, this publisher gave us. So we don't anticipate any additional costs for ancillary or supplemental materials as far as the social studies materials go. However, we do, of course, anticipate costs for curriculum implementation. You'll notice a very modest amount of $3,000 is listed there for fiscal year um, 12, and that's just there for any uh, unanticipated costs. Teachers specifically asked that they have an opportunity to work with the newly selected text the first year and within their departments working with their chairs share notes at their regular department meetings to discuss things such as pacing and sequencing and what will be appropriate with the power standards that we have drafted and how we might want to modify those standards as we've been working with the text and seeing what will be the most effective. You'll see the cost jumps 
very much the following year. And we're expecting in that next school year that at that time, we're going to be ready to fine tune the power standards and the indicators. Um, also, we're going to be ready to start creating proficiency scales. And from there, we're going to want to begin developing our common assessments. At this time, I'd like to invite our department chairs to join me to address any questions that you as the board might have. Any questions for the social studies team? One of the teacher issues, the red is the seventh and eighth grade. They split. Yeah. In seventh grade, then pick up the second half, and then sixth grade, this is the student textbook for sixth grade materials. Okay. Looks like we have a question. Mr. Collins. <clears throat> Just go over again for me. Uh, your the completion of your power standards mm -hmm. uh, all done or still no work to we develop? have a very good draft and in fact this summer we're going to be continuing work we have a team of middle school staff who will participate participate in the writing of those but in addition they are going to be working with the high school staff who is also fine-tuning their power standards and we're going to look at where we have our overlaps and what areas that we can adjust our focus because we do want to have some background knowledge built in the lower grades and that's where it's going to be important for us to look at what indicators we are emphasizing with those power standards for those levels. So we should have a pretty good draft that just needs to be fine-tuned as we're working through the text this next school year. And then how far, how far along are the, are the assessments? Uh, the assessments that we won't even start those until we've made a decision on um, the actual power standards, the sequencing of those, um, and the pacing that we need to set up. And our, our proficiency scales need to be set up before then because that will dictate how our common assessments will look. So it is a, a process that needs to follow steps. When would you predict that you would have that complete? Um, I, it, ideally, we would like to have that done by fiscal year 13 at that end. Okay. Um, in your projection of costs, mm -hmm. Um, are, are any of those costs, are, are, are there any appropriate teacher training costs or anything that, that you would anticipate? Um, as of right now, the publisher is telling us that any further professional development that we want, we do have some scheduled for the end of this year, um, we can get that at cost, but I don't know how long that offer is going to be valid. So if there is a point where... Um, the teachers will say in this process, even next year as they're working with the text, we would really like to have someone from the publisher come out again and then show us exactly the best way to use this part of the program. Um, there's the potential for cost for that, but really the main cost is going to be paying the teachers or the substitutes for that work to get done. Okay. And then what what's next in the implementation of social studies? Are we you go into the <laughs> elementary schools or the high schools? That's a good question. Um, I'm very fortunate because Charles Avando, the department chair, is really taking the lead with um, developing the curriculum work at the high school level. So it's just a matter of all of us staying connected, articulating, and developing a habit of having meetings where we continue that articulation. Elementary is still up in the air. I don't know if Dr. Sullivan, you want to comment on that. Well, as, as I think um, we mentioned before, one of our quandaries is when the Common Core um, is going to come out for science and for social studies. And we have a need both at elementary um, to look at the science curriculum, that piece is still hanging out there from our science study, and social studies. And we are still hanging. We're, what the State Board is saying is that we're going to see the frameworks, they're still saying it's the frameworks, by June, <laughs> next month or so. Uh, and then we may see the final science Common Core standards out within the following school year. Um, we really need to wait for those for science because it'll be grade level specific and we don't want to do something that has plants at one grade and then have our, our common core standards say no, it's at a different grade. 
Um, but they're also saying that social studies will be out within 18 months, um, which some of us find difficult because I don't know about you, but maybe not these three, but most social studies teachers have a hard time agreeing <laughs> on what should uh, be taught in, in, in certain uh, times and years. Um, so we're, we're going to wait and see what science looks like when it comes out and then make a recommendation as whether we're going to go science first or social studies first at elementary. We obviously can't do both at the same time because we're, you know, unlike middle school, we're talking about the same teachers and, right. and one at a time for them with that. So they we're, we're really up in the air. Both need some work. Okay. And lastly, I just want to say thank you. You've done a very nice job and I'm very oh. glad you're all here. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Mrs. Hirsch. Thank you. I have three very disjointed different questions. <laughs> OK. So the first off, uh, I appreciate you bringing the textbooks. Normally, we don't get the textbooks brought to us, OK? Not that we have time to be able to flip through them really at the board table. However, um, sometimes a prop is really helpful. When you look at the size and the weight of these books, Okay, I had a parent approach me this morning that talked about the backpacks that weigh 45 pounds. We don't need any weight training for our students in mm -hmm. a physical education program because our weight training program are the textbooks that we ask our students to bring back and forth to school each day. Um, while I appreciate uh, for you social studies experts, sometimes it takes a lot of words to explain the history of the United States and uh, world history. Um, these tomes are getting larger and heavier, and what we're looking, what I'm looking to see us move to is electronic. It's available online. I don't necessarily need to purchase a textbook if I am a visual reader and I need to have the tactile feel of reading the book. Can you help us? We've, we've helped you. We want to move in that direction. <laughs> it is available online, and um, we've actually had conversations about possibly having the textbook as just classroom sets to be used in the classroom if needed, but that was one of the things that we were talking about with the um, interactive technology. The students and parents will be able to access the full textbook from the convenience of their own home computer or library computer. This might be a little out there. Um, and I'm, I'm tossing you a curveball that I didn't give you ahead of time, so I'm not expecting an answer. But have we researched at all the option of not necessarily having to purchase a textbook for each student? And if there are possibilities for students opting out and saying, I have access to a computer at home, and having the teacher being able to facilitate the discussion without having students reading the classroom, have we explored any of those options at this point? Most of the publishers now, for, in order for you to get access to the online version, you have to buy the book. I mean, that's, that's, that's currently what's happening. Do we anticipate that changing down the line? Yes, probably as, you know, I mean, I think um, David and I have had numerous converse, conversations about where curriculum will be in five, even in five years in terms of looking at um, more digital um, curriculum that's available just that way. But then we have, we also then as, um, a, a district are going to have to deal with then providing the device for all of our students that that curriculum can be delivered on. But that is where the field is going. But currently publishers are wary, just as you I mean, maybe you've re, um, seen recently where um, some of the publishers have now limited ebooks in terms of library access to ebooks after so many times they then charge you again for another book. Right. So uh, the whole industry I think is grappling with how to still, you know, obviously make the profit that they need to make, um, but still delivering it in a, in a different way. So right now, um, because we, we had this issue with a textbook at York where it was available digitally, and, and, and one of the teachers said, well, you know, you can return the textbook, but technically you can't. You have to own the, purchase the textbook in order to access the digital materials. If I could also speak to uh, an element of the technological aspect. Hi, I'm Tony White from Churchville Middle School, formerly Sandberg. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a pleasure. I'd like to welcome the new board. It is truly an honor to be present at your first session. Um, I investigated the technology aspect. Um, you know, now laptops are not passe, but now certainly we're looking more towards the tablet, and especially the iPad. When you think about the tablet, you think of the iPad. The problem with the iPad is that it doesn't work with Adobe Flash, and most of the cool 
technological stuff, like the multimedia is mostly Adobe Flash. iPad works with HTML5. In contacting the Holt publishers, they said that they are working on getting an iPad compatible um, iBook, because currently an eBook would be more like a Kindle, where it's just merely the text and maybe some images, but no interactivity. Um, so it's certainly something that is down the line, but as Dr. Sullivan had alluded to, it's, it's not likely going to be ready within the next, you know, maybe 12 months or so. But it is an exciting time to be looking at that medium. So proud. You know, we have been meeting with um, uh, Follett, Follett uh, on um, their, their virtual bookstore. And um, if we end up going with that product, there would be the ability to purchase things um, that are digital, that are available digitally, um, as well as renting, as well as buying used, as well as buying new. But they brought up a really good point to us, which, which is um, having digital books means providing instruction a different way. And it means classroom management in a different way because it's rare that a device only has one book on it. You know, and so there's an attention issue. There is, you know, issues in terms of are you texting each other more than you're actually, you know, reading the the books if it's on your on your, you know, iPhone. You know, there's a lot of different issues in terms of that. And so this is going to be something that um, the new board um, is going to have to, uh, and and the administration will have to grapple with as as more and more things become available. Okay, that was just one of my disjointed questions. <laughs> um, one of the experiences that the district had in introducing the literacy curriculum in the elementary school is that we really, I think, did due diligence and tried to ensure that the leveled readers um, were going to be able to assess all the needs of all the students within 205. And I think upon implementation, we heard some feedback that there were some gaps, there were some areas, whether it was students that were at the higher achieving end who were not as challenged, or maybe there were some students who were ELL students who were challenged by some of the materials. And so I'd, I'd like your honest assessment in terms of, I know that you said we feel that this is age appropriate and this is appropriate um, for the level of reading, I personally have struggled with a student who was very high on the Lexile and couldn't seem to find appropriate reading material. So I'll be very thankful if we can really achieve that. Well, I appreciate that comment. One of the advantages with the um, materials that Holt is going to supply us with, as far as the content readers and the leveled re the content novels and the uh, leveled readers, we as a staff social studies team will be selecting which we want so that's something that we can take into consideration they are not just giving us a set we are choosing from hundreds of different titles so that is one thing that we we certainly can take into consideration so we appreciate that awareness they do also have within each unit they have a spanish uh, guided reading conversion so for the ELL students, that's included as part of the online. They also have extension uh, work for students that might need more of a challenge where they have working with DBQs and those um, more higher level writing out thoughts and um, comparing primary source data and then coming up with your own conclusion based on examining those. So they're within just, uh, there's a teacher one step that we have and just on that CD alone, there's a lot of differentiation for tweaking the lessons as you see fit, and you can do that within just one section of a chapter and go through and, and <clears throat> just adapt it as you need to for whatever your class may need for one section versus the whole book or a whole chapter. I applied your uh your responsibilities. We have leveled mathematics instruction at the middle school. We have leveled language arts instruction in the middle school. We do not have leveled science or social studies curriculum. And so you are dealing with a, the broad array of student abilities. And so I, I'm sure, hopefully, the differentiation materials are really going to help you be able to deliver the instruction that individual students need. And my last question I'm going to toss over here to Dr. Sullivan. Um, and, and that is, I appreciate the presentation, and you've made a selection of um, you know, the textbooks that we want to work with. Can you just foreshadow for us and help us understand the implementation phase where we need to get new teachers, materials, we need to get them training. I heard something about training at cost. I don't know what the training plan is and a little bit about how we're going to bring everybody on board. Well, you guys can chime in too, but generally, I, I will say generally publishers give you a year um, after your initial adoption for any um, training and 
at no cost. Mm -hmm. That's usually the standard kind of package. Um, what we would look at, even though we're looking at this, um, this adoption would really come out of next year's um, budget. Um, this publisher, like most, will work with us in terms of already sending materials to us before the end of the school year. And I think that um, Teresa alluded to the fact that we already have a, will have a training already set up before teachers leave. At so no that, cost. At no cost. So that they have their their teacher manuals, et cetera. Um, but what, we, what we've done with all implementations is really look at, um, you know, giving opportunities. And at the middle school, we have a different opportunity than we do with elementary. They have a department um, chair. They have mm -hmm. department meetings with their teachers. So on an ongoing basis, they have more of an opportunity to sit and meet and talk about, you know, what this particular unit, what worked, what didn't work, what did you like, um, how do we tweak that? How fast did it take you? Why did it only take you this long? It took me this long. Um, what were the you know activities? How their their students did? They have the middle school has that advantage of of having that that we don't normally with elementary. We have to either sub teachers out constantly or pull you know pull them after school to do that. So that will be all part of that first implementation, um, just like we've been doing for science this year. Even looking at the the assessments that that. Um, people have been giving and, and what worked and what didn't work. So that's all parts of that. And then we, you know, are fortunate to have chairs to help identify um, particular areas. If, if they find that there's a particular um, piece that their teachers are struggling with, that's when we can call in the publisher and do some additional training. So we really, we really, um, in this case, will look to their leadership as well to help us identify what what their teachers need. Um, they're there on a day-to-day -day basis. They help us, you know, they'll help us um, with that plan. Um, so do you have anything that you all would like to add to that? We just don't buy the books and throw them at the teachers and say, <laughs> have at it, right? No. Um, really try to provide the support and really tweak um, throughout the year, you know, what we're going to do. I think what we'll see for institute days when we have the opportunities to meet as a group um, and also to coordinate um, more with the high school and then it, hopefully at some point with elementary when we work on that elementary piece. Anything you guys want to add? Come on. Uh, I'll, just, I'll say something very quickly. Just um, Jim Tang at Bryan Middle School, the teachers meet not only in departments, but they also meet by uh, grade levels. So in sixth grade, we'll have uh, a lot of time each week uh, where we will meet as a social studies uh, teachers and we'll talk about next year, obviously, what, what worked and what didn't work, what was good, what wasn't good, um, how can we do this differently, how can we do that better. So it really will be an ongoing discussion all year long. Uh, it won't just be here's the book on, on day one and then at the end of the year we'll reassess where we're at. It'll really be a kind of a constant uh, collaboration amongst professionals uh, weekly and kind of taking a look at um, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the program and how can we make it better. Mr. Collins, one last comment. One last quick question. It's inspired by Mrs. Hirsch's uh, question about the weight of these textbooks. Um, before I was elected to the Board of Education and actually had time to keep track of my children's, my own <laughs> children's education, I, um, I seem to remember that a textbook came home for the entire year and we had enough textbooks that we could do that because they had another set in class. Am I confusing Sam elementary Hirsch. school with yeah, Sandberg does. Sandberg is still doing that currently. Okay. Students and take it home at the beginning of the year, and then just over the years with what we've accumulated, I have a class set that they use in the classroom so that they can take their bags. They yeah. don't have to carry it back and forth. Do we have money allocated in the budget to do that with this new series? No. <laughs> How, how much more? We have a digital, but we have the digital option, which we didn't have with the other series. That's true. So that's the piece. So we may have some limited additional text, but we absolutely, unequivocally, can't afford to buy double text for every student. Okay. I, I guess my my question then is is can we just keep track of how the digital option is is going, um, and ask these ask the kids if it is an acceptable substitute to them. Thank you, Team Middle School Social Studies. We appreciate your coming here this evening. We appreciate also all of the hard work that you've done to come to this point. Um, clearly, we needed it with 11 years of not having uh, updated social studies. Things have happened. And not, that's not to say teachers weren't embellishing, but I'm sure this will make it much easier. We, we really appreciate your dedication and your time here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.
I don't need to keep them. <laughs> 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 Next item on our agenda is the superintendent's agenda, the consent agenda. What this means is that any of the items on here, um, if you would like to discuss them in any way, you would indicate so by telling me and we will pull it off that consent agenda once we get everything off of it that we want to talk about. Usually the things that are on there are things that are non-controversial, things that um, pretty much don't take a separate motion each time. But when we make the motion for the consent agenda, it will be then passed without discussion. So is there anyone who would like to remove one of the items? On the consent agenda this evening, we have the uh, personnel report, financial reports, Freedom of Information Act requests the approval of a donation to Edison Elementary School, computer, of a computer equipment lease, uh, the approval of the display of these social studies materials, which we're required to do by law, put on display any of the materials that we are going to be using in the classroom for 30 days, um, and also approval of high school and elementary school uh, instructional materials. Those, I pr presume, have already been on display, so we are now at the point where we're going to um, approve those for purchase. Would anyone like to remove anything from the consent agenda? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented in our packet. Is there a second? Moved by Mrs. Hirsch, seconded by lots of people, Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Stufen. Um, all those, no, we need a roll call, I believe. Mrs. Walsh, can you call the roll? Ms. Hirsch? Yes. Mrs. Stufen? Yes. Mrs. Droney? Yes. Mr. McDonough? Yes. Mrs. Ebner? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Mr. Bloom? Yes. Seven ayes, no nays, that motion carries. Next item on our, our agenda is the upcoming meetings. We have our uh, workshop meeting on Tuesday, May 10th, here at the District 205 offices and followed by our regular business meeting on May 24th. Um, we have a couple of action on a couple of items need to be acted on coming out of closed session this evening. Could I have a motion for item A, please? Yes. I move that the Board of Education adopt the resolution entitled Resolution authorizing notice of honorable dismissal of certain educational support personnel. Is there a second? It's been moved by Mrs. Hirsch, seconded by Mr. Collins to adopt the resolution entitled Resolution authorizing notice of honorable dismissal of certain educational support personnel. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Hirsch. Could I ask Dr. Krizik to just give us a quick overview of what this action is? Um, yes, there are two groups of individuals in this honorable dismissal. Um, the first group is first year um, instructional assistants serving special education students. We historically, for the past several years, have um, honorably dismissed those individuals until at which time we can determine what our um, need for those individuals are based on the IEPs that are um, undergoing any reviews at this point in time. So um, many of those individuals may be recalled for the next school year. The second group of individuals included in this list include the positions that were identified as reductions through the EPIRC process. Um, so those were um, uh, PSRP or support personnel positions um, that uh, range from secretary positions to a health aid position. Um, those were basically the categories. So there are two categories. One is a result of our financial reductions as part of EPERT, which positions, which, the, which those positions would not be replaced, they would be eliminated. And the other would be the um, special education assistance that will um, are determined on a need-based student issue. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. That motion carries. The last item is um, another action out of closed session. Uh, could I have a motion for item B, Mr. Collins? I move that the Board of Education accept and authorize the Board President and Board Secretary to assign 
the settlement agreement entitled Lunchroom Cafeteria Supervision Grievance. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by, moved by Mr. Collins, seconded by Mr. McDonough to accept and authorize the President and Secretary to sign the settlement agreement entitled Lunchroom Cafeteria Supervision Grievance. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, um, we need a roll call. Mrs. Walsh, could you call the roll? Mr. Collins? Yes. Mr. McDonough? Yes. Mr. Bloom? Yes. Mrs. Droney? Yes. Mrs. Abner? Yes. Ms. Hirsch? Yes. Mrs. Stufen? Yes. Seven ayes, no nays. That motion carries. Next item on our agenda is board communications. Anyone have anything they wish to share with the board this evening? Mr. Collins. We have perhaps an unprecedentedly inexperienced board, they would, given that we have uh, four brand new members. And I just want to ask there are new members. There are some boards that have a formal mentoring process. Um, and we don't need a, a conclusion or an answer this evening, but I just wanted to start the discussion if that is something you're interested in, um, in actually choosing a board member or having a board member assigned to you to kind of answer a, a lot of those questions that, that you've got along the way, especially in the first few months. So think about it. Let us know. Um, Mrs. Hirsch, you had something. Uh, Thank you. I attended the York PTSA meeting last week as a representative of the board, and the topic of discussion was um, uh, the tiered fee structure for the athletics program that was coming out uh, for the fall. Um, one of the things that came up um, in discussions, there was an interest expressed in better understanding um, what the activity bus options might look like uh, in implementation uh, for next year. Uh, Dr. Krizik, can you give us an update on uh, what your team is working on in terms of possibilities, um, possibly offering some flexibility for some of the families that we've got? I think since the, um, in the last few weeks, um, we've received some feedback, yeah, obviously feedback that you've received at the PTSA meeting, and we received some indirect fee feedback about what is the implementation going to be of the new fee that was added for transportation, somewhat discussed in public comment this evening. One of the things that we have not yet done, although we posted it as a fee on InfoSnap, was talk about implementation options. What we'd like to do at the May 10th meeting is come back and just share with you what those options would be. Some of our preliminary thoughts are looking at um, providing three different options. One is um, breaking up the high school and middle school sports season into three different seasons and have $110 per season, which totals up to $330 per year. This addresses the issue of students in the winter sports and it, it, um, it straddles both the first semester and second semester, are they responsible for the whole year? The answer, we're looking at not, the answer to that being no. We're also looking at semester fee op, and a semester fee option too. There could be students that are participating in an activity in the first semester but not in the second semester and have that option. Ms. Masterton's also going to be working with Jeff Hartman and the high school staff looking at for the, I'll say the one-offs, the students that are taking the late bus occasionally, maybe it's for their staying after school to study with a group of students or they're participating in something special. Whether or not through the bookstore we can be selling, let's say, a pack of 10 bus passes to be utilized. And then how do we coordinate that implementation with first student? Because remember, those are not our employees. We contract out with them. And we're not looking to put in place an implementation that suddenly has an exponential cost factor going along with it. So we'd like to lay out all of those various options to you and some of the thinking that goes along with what our options will be for the upcoming school year at the May 10th meeting, so we're prepared to do that. The other thing that we'll do, and I'll give you just a little bit about this now, is, is that when we made the um, transportation, um, when we made the recommendations to increase um, expenditures or do some cost recovery sort of strategies. 
Um, transportation was one of those things that came also after the EPIRT process when Ms. Masterton learned that funding to the transportation account was going to be se severely limited. This was information that wasn't provided to the EPIRT committee at the time, and so we needed to look at ways of how do we further reduce our transportation expenses if we anticipate our revenue and reimbursement from the state to be decreased even further. We currently run 21 um, one-way buses, either before or after school, between the middle school and the high school. Those one-way buses um, run at a cost of $9,900 per year each. each. So that totals up to be about $207,000, if I do the math really quickly. Um, in order, when we came up with the $330 per year per student, um, Ms. Masterton averaged 30 students per bus to get that cost down, when in actuality, the average buses, in some cases, are 10 to 15, 10 to 20 students. And on any given day, there might be two students. And on any given day, there might be 40 students. But we use the average of 30. The attempt was to attempt to have cost recovery of approximately 25% of what it is costing to run those buses for extracurricular activities, clubs, as well as athletics. So it wasn't uh, a cost recovery for 100% of our costs. It was approximately 25% of our costs. But we'll lay that out a little bit further in more detail when we can spend a little bit more time on it and give you a little bit more background information. And then what we'll do is we'll put a communication plan together that we can disseminate to our families as well so people can understand what options they may have. It's going to take some conversations with both the high school and our bus company. Um, and there is not a swipe card option. There's none of those options. It'll have to be something that is simply implemented that we can also get cooperation from um, for student as well. So we'll work on that in the next two weeks. I'll just let you know that Ms. Masterton is on a well, is headed towards a well-deserved vacation next week. So she's going to try to get some of this done um, before she leaves. Um, so you may not have any of those materials until right before the board meeting on the 10th so that we have time to get everything um, assembled and put together. But it'll, it'll be more of an informational meeting, not an action item um, for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Hirsch, for giving us the opportunity to talk a little bit about this this evening. Thank you. Mrs. Dufin, did you want to make a comment? Nothing? Anybody else? Board communications. OK. Mr. McDonough. Um, just want to say thank you to the board members, the uh, continuing board members, the now past board members, and my new colleagues um, at this end of the table. Um, I guarantee the resounding silence over here will not continue for long. <laughs> Um, this is a new process for us and appreciate your patience as we get accustomed to some of the format of the discussion here. So thank you all very much for your assistance in helping get us up to speed. Are you telling us our honeymoon is over? <laughs> Just wait. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn the meeting. Is there a second? <laughs> Moved by Mrs. Steuben, <laughs> seconded by Mr. Bloom to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. Thank you and good night. Go Hawks.